olive oil has all of these amazing antioxidant properties already within them. Olive oil has anti-inflammatory properties. It doesn't have the antimicrobial properties, which is good. And then you put the spores in there and rub that into the skin and it, it makes a big difference. So you, then you'll get benefit both from the olive oil and from the spores themselves. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to the Healthy Skin Show. We're laying it down in episode number 11. Today is part two of Karan Krishnan's interview. And so if you didn't get the chance to check that out, head back to episode number 10, start there. That way you'll be able to pick up the conversation and know where we are. And I know for those of you who've been dying to hear how and where this interview goes, you're going to be in for a treat in a moment. But before we dive into that, I just want to say thank you so much to all the amazing reviews that you guys have been sharing over on iTunes. I have to say, I've honestly been wowed. (laughs) You know, I put a lot of thought into creating the Healthy Skin Show, and I did it out of my deep desire to support and connect all of us within this community and also to empower you so that you know you have a choice. Your feelings, your experiences, your symptoms matter, and that we can do better. And if we as a community come together, Maybe we can even change the way the conventional dermatology is viewing these symptoms and these conditions so that they will provide everyone who comes to their office with a chronic skin rash complaint better options. I wanted to share one really cool review that 12345 Red Dog. <laughs> left called Eureka portal to the holy grail of health. I really appreciate that. That's super nice way to describe the healthy skin show in this. um, The reviewer says I am a psoriasis sufferer for 30 years. Now I have listened to numerous podcasts over the years on a mission to heal my skin. Nothing has ever compared to the wealth of information that I have received from tuning into the healthy skin show. Together with her guests, Jennifer dives into a plethora of alternative holistic approaches, solutions to heal things from the inside out, microbiome, prebiotics, gut matters, immune system, and hormone issues are just a few of the topics covered in this magnificent podcast. As an eczema sufferer herself, Jennifer truly cares about helping others and she's nothing short of brilliant. And I feel blessed to share this healing journey with her. Bravo. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I really deeply appreciate that. And I'm so glad that you guys are all finding value. And I can tell you right now, as of this moment, we have literally another 40 episodes that are getting ready to head your way and lots more interviews scheduled. So if you, again, have any questions, any topics, or any suggestions of anything you'd love for us to cover, head on over to www.healthyskinshow.com, scroll all the way to the bottom, and leave us a voicemail. And either we'll include your question in a future show, or we may take your suggestion and run with it. So that way we can get answers to your questions and connect the community with answers that they're searching for. All right, I think now we should just dive straight into part two of the interview that I did with Karan. I'll tell you guys, every single time I talk with him, I feel like my brain is going to explode because of how much amazing information is stored within him. He's an amazing researcher and he really, man, he's just so generous with his time that he was willing to come and share this much information. So... Let's continue with part two. You know, it's interesting. So I want to share this testimonial, by the way, because I think this is really helpful. So after your talk, this woman, Kara, had actually shared this during the Eczema and Psoriasis Summit. She said that after listening to your talk about applying probiotics topically, and I, I definitely think we should talk about that, two applications later over 24 hours and her baby's itching is significantly less. It's not a miracle fix, but over time, I think this is really going to help. He is sleeping with no mittens tonight, and that hasn't happened in much of his seven months of life. 
that that is so amazing to hear and it makes like all of the research and travel and hours of reading papers and studying the stuff worth it just for that one story right it's so amazing and and it's true in the way we even thought about it uh, because we work with these unique strains of probiotics so these are the bacillus endospores most of the other probiotics people would have access to can't do this kind of stuff because they don't have the capability of functioning on the outside and on the inside and all these unique things now the way i i even thought about that these particular probiotics can even help on the outside of the skin is because in nature if you were walking around in you know in 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 the forest or in the desert your body would become saturated and colonized with a lot of these types of bacteria and and throughout the course of human evolution our ancestors who were smart enough to live and eat live in dirt and eat dirt they were basically covered with these types of bacteria and these types of bacteria play a unique role of inhibiting the overgrowth of certain pathogenic bacteria even on the skin. And we actually did a small internal test, this was just in our lab, where we took these particular probiotic spores and put them on a cell phone. So if you've ever swabbed your cell phone, you'll know that it is a horrifically contaminated <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> I've it's, heard it's, it's pretty filthy. Crazy. It's pretty <laughs> filthy, yeah, it's filthy. It's picking up everything from everywhere and these, these bugs just sit on the cell phone. So we actually added these spores to the cell phone and then we and then we checked the the surface area of the cell phone for the next two three weeks. There were virtually there was virtually nothing else growing on there. So somehow these probiotic bacteria were warding off any other microbes that are trying to take over in that space. And so one of the things that we know about the skin is there's a couple of classes of important bacteria that keep the skin healthy. But once you start to get an overgrowth of a bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus you end up with eczema, dermatitis, and so on. So it's just a matter of switching the types of bacteria that are, that are growing on the skin. Now, these spores, because they know how to compete against those type of pathogenic bacteria, the idea was if these spores were on your skin, they would somehow ward off the, those types of bacteria. And as it turns out, we've seen that over and over again in numerous cases. Okay, so you're saying that because there's certain strains that can crowd out and control what is growing, we could then utilize, and this is what we sort of, we started to touch on this toward the end of our discussion in the eczema and psoriasis event, but I think it's good to talk about this now. So we could theoretically, like you said, we could work our way from the in, the outside in using probiotics to help rebalance and crowd out the bad bacteria. But then we could also use the probiotics from the inside out yeah. to produce these byproducts like butyrate and other small chain fatty acids, but specifically butyrate that can then move its way out to the skin to work from the inside out. So we have this two-pronged approach essentially yeah. Microbiome wise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the reason is because there's different communities on the skin. So your epidermal layer has a different bacterial community than a couple of millimeters in, you know, where your hair follicles are, where the little pouches, the vesicles are in the subdermal area. All of those areas have slightly different types of bacterial communities. And so looking at this two prong approach, we're basically going after all of the bacterial communities at once so that even if we are improving one, but the other one is completely disruptive, the improvements might take much longer because it, the change might take longer to reflect in all layers. So going at it with a two-pronged approach, we've seen in general, in people with severe psoriasis and eczema, we see in general in clinics that that tends to give better results faster. Mm. And so in that case, is there a reason why spore-based bacteria or spore, how would you describe them? They're spore-based bacteria? You know, because Megaspore is an amazing product. And and what I've mostly gotten testimonials for is Megaspore. I personally take it. I use it in a lot of clients and have had a lot of success with it. But is there something about it because it is a spore probiotic that maybe gives it an edge for helping with these sort of things, whereas a non-spore form might not be as effective? Yeah, absolutely. And it's all in the words. So the, the fact that they are spore-based, and that is the correct way to classify them. A lot of times people will confuse them as soil-based, but they're not soil-based because 
typically soil-based organism products are homeostatic soil organisms. So a lot of people call soil-based also HSOs. HSOs, homeostatic soil organisms, or soil-based organisms are organisms whose job and function is predominantly in the soil. So what they do in the soil is they fix nitrogen for the roots of the plants, they break down plant matter, they break down decaying animal matter, they do all these wonderful things for the soil to bring life to the soil. These particular spores exist in the soil, but what they're doing is they're sitting in the soil and using the soil as a vector to get from host to host. Their natural home is in us and to some degree on us as well. And because they are a spore, that's what's really interesting about them. They've got this armor-like coating around them, which is basically like a protein calcified armor-like coating that allows them to exist in the outside world indefinitely without being killed by UV radiation and desiccation, all these other things that would kill normal gut bacteria. And then that also allows them to enter through the gastric system, which is a very harsh system for most probiotic bacteria. So we've tested 98, 99% of all probiotic products we've tested, and we've tested 40 of the top, all just die in the stomach, right? They don't, they don't make it to the site of action alive. They don't have the capability and stability to survive through the stomach acid. And so the spores make it through, and then they are by nature really strong competitive bacteria, and they compete against pathogenic bacteria. And, and in fact, they've been used for that in the prescription world since 1952, right? So two-thirds really? of the world. Yeah, it's, it's wow. amazing. When we first discovered these types of strains, we said, okay, who's been using these? Because their their properties are so mind-boggling. And then you look, and Sanofi, Aventis, and all these major pharma companies have had spore-based probiotic products in the prescription market since 1952 in Europe, Latin America, Southeast Asia, they've been using them to treat dysentery, they've been using them to treat chronic upper respiratory infections, all of these kind of infective inflammatory conditions, they've been using them as a prescription treatment for those without side effects, which is the benefit of it, right? And so we said, wow, these must have some tremendous effects in, in the body. And that's why we, we, we jumped on the spores and we started really studying them to figure out what they do. But yeah, being a spore, that's the key. So people want to look for spore-based probiotics, and that's what Megaspore is. It's the first multi-spore kind of high-dose spore-based probiotic. And I'll just share personally, <laughs> and you know, this is a true story. Like I had gotten really sick, and I'll never forget my friends at Rebel Health Tribe had sent me a bottle. It was my yeah. first experience, and, and Joe was like, you got to try these. And I was like, I can't swallow those pills because I can't swallow pills. I have like a fear yeah. from being a kid. And he's like, no, 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 just empty it into like a shake or something. You'll be fine. So I ended up getting very bad diarrhea. I have no idea what I, I don't know what happened, but really bad. And I took it. And within two days, I was like back to normal. Like I had a really bad stomach bug and I was just like back and feeling right. great. It really, really helped. And that was what had changed my mind. And then I also continued that when I developed my eczema on my hands. That was when I really started making it a, a bit more vigorous of a, a process because I could add it to food. I could eat it mm -hmm. easily. So it's great for kids and whatnot. I mean, obviously you have to do, I, I tend to tell people like to start with a lower dose, like maybe even do a quarter capsule, especially if you're really sensitive, start with a quarter and like slowly work your way up. But the idea of applying it to the skin when you had said that was so interesting to me because I've read a lot of articles about that. And of course, people are just talking about, oh, just put some yogurt on your face or on the rash. And I'm like, yogurt? Right. The sugar is not going to help your skin. That's no. Sure. And the bacteria, it's interesting too. The bacteria in your skin, they don't break down starches like our gut right. flora does. They break down fats, as right. you had said. So for anyone who didn't hear that portion of this conversation, and I think everyone would pro could probably do with a refresher, if you wanted to apply like Megaspore, for example, or an, uh, maybe try if you just have a probiotic at home and you're like, let me just try this, I can't, how can it hurt? What would be your recommendation of how they should like utilize it? Is there any do's and don'ts and whatnot that you could suggest as a way to apply it topically? Yeah, I would I would say use whatever your favorite carrier is. In the case of Megaspore, it doesn't really matter because it, it they're such strong bacteria that 
even for example, if you use coconut oil, because coconut oil is a, is a fairly strong antimicrobial. So if you mix most of the bacteria in coconut oil, it's going to kill the bacteria. But with with Megaspore, it won't. So you can take a tiny bit of coconut oil, put some of the probiotic powder that you just removed from the capsule, and mix it in and just set it on your skin and rub it into your skin and just leave it on there, you know, for the rest of the day. And you can do that a couple of times a day. You can use shea butter. I know I've used shea butter as a base and just kind of added some amount of the powder to it. There's no real dosing specificity to it. You know, I would start with less. Less, less is more in this kind of case. And just take a little bit of powder and just see how your skin tolerates it. And I'm going to say too, you could also sprinkle some on and then reclose the capsule. They don't need to be yeah. refrigerated. So that's a really big plus. I, I want to ask you, because I've actually had a few people ask me about the coconut oil. It's an antimicrobial. So if say somebody has, I don't know, some sort of just a regular lactobacillus or some sort of thing going on in their refrigerator or something they bought at the natural food store, and they mix that with the coconut oil, is it likely to be less effective because of the coconut's antimicrobial properties? Yeah, yeah. More than likely the coconut will kill. The, the long chain fatty acids in coconut oil will kill those bacteria. And, and then coconut has the long chain fatty acids are pretty strong antimicrobials. Lauric acid, I, when I was working in the food industry, one of the things that I was helping companies develop was natural, less toxic antimicrobials because they have to use antimicrobials in some part of the food industry to to keep things clean. And one of the things we were promoting was a lauric acid, which is part of the coconut fatty acids that are found in coconut oil. And it kills everything. It kills, you know, good bacteria, bad bacteria, everything. So you want to be careful with coconut oil as well, even if you're just using it on its own on your skin, because there has to be a microbiome on your skin. And if you're using too much of an antimicrobial for too long, you could decimate that that microbiome and leave room for less favorable bacteria to take hold, right? So we, we want to be careful with using it too much. I like, I have done this before as well, use a little bit of extra virgin olive oil and open up the capsule and put it in because olive oil has all of these amazing antioxidant properties already within them. Olive oil has anti-inflammatory properties. It doesn't have the antimicrobial properties, which is good. And then you put the spores in there and rub that into the skin and it it makes a big difference. So you, then you'll get benefit both from the olive oil and from the spores themselves. Because we're feeding the skin with an appropriate type of fat that it yeah. needs for those bacteria to thrive. I think that's one of the biggest pieces. Like I see people do, oh, I'm putting like this sugar scrub on my face or I'm doing, I'm not like, no, 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 no sugar. Right. <laughs> bacteria on your face and your skin don't want sugar. They no, want you know, fat. You know, you know, who wants sugar on your face is fungus. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, fungus will love the sugar on your face, so be careful with that because, and, and a lot of people suffer from fungal overgrowths on their skin, you know, and so we've all used antimicrobial soaps, all of these things, all of that stuff favors fungal overgrowth, and so you want to be careful of using sweet things because that's what the fungus likes. And last question, because you just brought this up, it's a good question. If you do have, say, candida is the issue. I've had a lot of clients who've had candida overgrowth in the gut and they've got lots of skin rashes. I had one client that had it everywhere, super bad in her armpits. Like she was mm -hmm. so uncomfortable. What is Megaspore? How can it compare to candida? Like, can it go up against candida? What's the deal with that for anybody that's listening who's not, who's like, mm, can I use that with candida? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing about candida is it's it's always present, right? So candida is a normal part of our microbiome, both inside and outside on us. It's always going to be there. The average hum human has almost 200 different species of candida in them. So candida overgrowth is a symptom of other issues going on because it's an opportunistic fungus. The moment your immune system and the rest of your microbiome is suppressed for whatever reason, it'll start blooming and overgrowing. Now, like any other fungus, one of the things that makes it hard to get it back under control is because they have these hyphae that basically barb themselves into the surfaces that they're growing into. So even though you might take like an antifungal that'll kill off the growing fungus, it'll leave this little hyphae stuck into that part of the skin. And the moment the coast is clear, it'll just pop back up again. You know, so people keep getting it. They might use antifungals, that either topical or oral antifungal, and then it'll just keep coming back and coming back. And the problem with that is they're not addressing the uh, 
the original cause of the candida overgrowth, which is typically a nutritional issue, an immune issue, or microbiome issue, or usually all three. So one of the nutritional issues is that those people tend to have high heavy metal toxicity. Heavy metal toxicity can really suppress the immune system, and the immune system, part of its job is to control candida. And then it can also disrupt the normal microbiome, whose job it is to control candida. Now, what we see with megaspore, why it seems to really help with candida, is, of course, the spores will directly compete with candida. So they will actually compete for space and nutrients with candida and, and pop those guys off the, the surface that they're barbed into and get them going out of the system. The second thing is megaspore also increases the diversity of the rest of the microbiome. So it helps bring back other microbes that were suffering for whatever things that the person's going through that's affecting their microbiome. So as you start bringing back the other microbes, as the megaspore can actually sit next to the candida and fight it off, you'll start getting that candida under control. A great story of this is one of the very first people that actually took megaspore. So my business partner, his name is Dr. Tom Bain. So he's kind of functional medicine, gut focus practitioner. And the first 300 people that took the product were his patients, right? This is a little over five years ago. I remember this one vividly because this happened with like the fourth patient. This patient had severe candida overgrowth and he had all kinds of symptoms because of it. And he had it for years and, and Tom was trying to control it with other things that were available at the time, but wasn't really having great success. He took the Megaspore the second day, he called up the clinic and he said, you know, I'm feeling really good, but I don't know if this is normal, but I'm pooping out pink foam. So his bowel movements turned into just pink foam coming out, right? And we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> that, that could be a little concerning. That's not right. sound we're normal. Like, but he's like, I feel great. Okay. But I, it's just this pink foam. We said, okay. So we're trying to sit in there and we're trying to figure out, okay, what in the world could this be? Well, he had severe candida overgrowth. And basically what's happening is the spores are going in, getting the candida shoved out of the system. Fungus are like surfactants. So they kind of foamy when you mix them in water. So that's why you see beer, which is made by, by a fungus, basically has foam at the top, that head of the beer, because they produce all of this gas and stuff. So, so the, the fungus is coming out of the system. And because the hyphae are actually detaching and leaving, it's actually leaving the spots where the fungus was are slightly open, the sores. They're kind of like open sores to some degree because uh, the candida feeds off of some of the top layer of skin wherever it was, it was uh, colonized. So some of that skin layer is coming off. That caused a pink color. And then the, the, the candida is coming out as foam. So for like three or four days, he just kind of pooped out all this pink foam. And then he had completely normal bowel movements. And, and for the first time in almost a decade, had zero candida symptoms after that you know and i'll say that's the only time uh, among even really overwhelmed people with overwhelming candida overgrowth did we hear about the pink foam we see changes in the stool but that was a very clear indication that the candida are getting out of there you know the when, when the spores come in yeah and so we should clarify that if you take mega sport that probably won't happen to you <laughs> no it's never happened again which is I've been waiting for it again, uh, just because I would I would love to be able to like get a sample of that and test it. But what was cool about that for us was that it was so indicative of some big change happening in the gut, you know. And the guy was feeling great, which was what the best part about it was. But he just had this unique foamy kind of poop. But his life was changed after that completely. And it is amazing when you repattern the gut, what happens. It takes time. I mean, I never make promises of people that, oh, your rash is going to be gone in a week or two weeks, I, I, I tend to find that most of the clients I work with, they've tried all these different elimination diets. And at the end of the day, like food was not really the problem. It was something, it was a gut issue. You know, there's candida or some other pathogenic bacteria or a, just a real dysbiotic state that was not supportive of good health. And so I, I think it's important if you're listening to this conversation to realize that yes, regardless of what type of skin condition you have, it doesn't have to be autoimmune, by the way. There is a connection between the gut 
and the skin. And there is, I guess, could we call it a crosstalk, essentially, like that they communicate with these signals, like uh, communicate via butyrate and some other inflammatory pathways and things like that. And so your skin is a reflection, as you've said, of what's going on inside. So we need to look there. Yeah, it's called the gut skin axis for a reason. So in in scientific literature, we call it the gut skin axis. And anytime there's a word axis in things, it means that there it's a two way conversation. And in fact, the gut controls the skin in large part. Now, like you said, it doesn't have to be because of just autoimmune conditions. It can be other things, including aging. So how fast your skin ages, the appearance of wrinkles, the um, hydration levels of the skin, the thickness of the skin, which is in youthful, when people are younger and they're youthful, they actually have thicker skin. And as the skin thins, you start to see it looking more translucent and less lively, right? And in fact, in, in Japanese culture and all that, they have words for that. Like in Japanese culture, they call it sarasara something or the other. I can't remember the second <laughs> part of the, of the word, but that's a very big thing the Japanese women are concerned about is the thickness of their skin and that's what gives it that kind of creamy youthful look all of those things are controlled by the gut one of the reasons why we're working with the prebiotic now is some of these oligosaccharide prebiotics have studies showing that even just eight weeks of taking it seems to to be able to reduce appearance of wrinkles on the skin improve hydration of the skin as as measured chemically and then also improving the redness of the skin and, and the thickness of the skin as well so aging is a is a major impact on the skin and that is also controlled by the gut in large part well i just want to thank you so much for agreeing to be back on i know we've got we fortunately this is going to be a continued conversation because i feel like there's so much more that we can even delve into but yeah. we've got a whole lot for people to unpack and digest and on top of it i just want to share with everyone we will have some details on this amazing we've got some gift baskets to share with you guys so i'm looking forward to getting the winners of those gift baskets their prizes i will talk about that in a few moments. But I just want to share with all of you, if you've been listening to this and you're like, hey, I want to check out Megaspore Biotic. And and listen, this is this whole conversation was not even meant to be it's not an advertisement, by the way, guys. Like this is something I use in a clinical practice. It's different than what's on the market, what you can get in the pharmacy and whatnot. I personally use it. I've had a lot of clients see improvements. So I figured I would share this because it's just it can be a real game changer, both internally and externally. So I'm going to share a link as well. If you want to grab a bottle, you can go through my link and you'll be able to get access to this and to this prebiotic that we'll talk about, we've talked about, and that we'll, you know, I hope we can talk about that the next time. Yeah. So more about prebiotics and maybe immunoglobulin therapy and all sorts of different fun stuff that affects the skin. But thank you so, so much for joining us, Karan. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you again for having me, and I would love to do it again, so let's do it again. Awesome. What incredible knowledge, right, guys? That is just so amazing, and I have so much gratitude that Karan was willing to spend so much time, and I'm sure that he will be willing to come back again. So again, if you have any questions, go on over to the Healthy Skin Show page and leave us a question. And hopefully that's something that we can include in an upcoming episode with Karan when he comes back. For those of you wondering how you can learn more about Megaspore Biotic, please head on over to this episode's post. I will have in the show notes a link so that you can get your hands on Megaspore Biotic if that's something that you want to give a try. I've had a lot of luck with it in client cases, using it both orally as well as topically. It does not work for everybody. Again, everything that we talk about here on the Healthy Skin Show, there are no silver bullets. And yes, there is probably a bit more trial and error that you're gonna have to do, but most likely you may not have even been down this route. So if you're open to the idea and you wanna give it a try, I will put a link to where you can actually purchase that particular probiotic. It's not something you can go to the store and get. And I'll put the link that way so it's really easy for you to access. And anything else that we've discussed in this episode, you can find in the show notes, all right? So I just wanna thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm excited for the next episode coming up. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so yet. And then I'll see you in the next episode where we can continue this conversation 
diving deep, talking about the stuff that really matters to you, helping you get answers so that you can begin building healthier skin. See you then.